Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic Hypersonic. I'm Barry P. Cook, and I want to talk to you about the season finale of season four of Lower Decks. It was called Old Friends, New Planets. And as it starts, we get a flashback to Starfleet Academy, where Nova Squadron is discussing doing that Colbert starburst maneuver that got everybody in trouble back in the episode The First Duty on Star Trek The Next Generation. And as this is happening, Mariner approaches the group, which includes, by the way, Cito Jaxa, voiced by the original actress, Wesley Crusher, voiced by Will Wheaton, and of course, Nick Licarno, as voiced by Robert Duncan McNeil. And she does this to gush to Cito about her experience at Starfleet Academy so far as a first year. And she's told a bit about the Starburst plan before the flashback ends. And Nick tells Mariner in the present about what he's been up to and that he thinks she'll join his cause, which is to recruit more people from all over to his fleet, which of course he calls Nova Fleet. And it wasn't really clear what his goal was beyond that. Meanwhile, both of Mariner's parents are ordered not to pursue a rescue operation because Starfleet doesn't want to fire the first shot against Nick's fleet full of races from various Federation and non-Federation worlds. It turns out that Nick has set up some kind of crazy powerful shield to keep everyone away from his fleet, and that he's also acquired a Ferengi black market Genesis device, which he's holding as a trump card in case anyone does get through the shield. But during a quadrant-wide message where he calls for people to join his cause, while Rutherford and Boimler discuss whether or not he looks exactly like Tom Paris, (laughs) Mariner manages to wrestle the device away from him and run away with it on board his ship. And Captain Freeman decides to disobey orders and attempt a rescue with the full-throated support of the crew. Mariner manages to steal a small Starfleet ship from Nick's fleet by using her mother's Starfleet command code and flying it by stick. Now, I wasn't sure how her mother's command code would work on that ship. I mean, I guess because she's a Starfleet captain, it would work. But normally those things are encoded to specific ships and don't carry over. So I don't know about that. Anyway, while this is happening, the Cerritos goes to Orion to get Tendi's sister's help in the form of a ship powerful enough to get through Nick's shield. And when the captain is rebuffed, Tendi demands that the matter be decided by means of combat between her and her sister with the Cerritos as a prize. Marion realizes that she can't get very far because of the shield, which keeps vessels in as well as out. So she heads for some space debris to hide and fends off a Ferengi ship after trying unsuccessfully to talk some sense to them about the situation, despite the fact that she quoted a rule of acquisition to them before having to sideline them by venting some coolant plasma at them. On Orion, Tendi puts the bird doctor guy, Dr. Miglimu, up as the Cerritos' champion against her sister's champion, whose name is Baeth, which is hilarious. And despite the fact that she instructed him to puff himself up, causing his down feathers to trigger an allergic reaction in Baeth, he loses the fight when she passes out on top of him. And the captain is asked to make good on the deal and turn over the Cerritos. But Tendi tells her sister that if she refrains from taking the Cerritos, she'll come back to Orion and serve under her, which she knows her sister has long wanted, in exchange for continuing with the deal to allow the captain to borrow an Orion ship. And the sister agrees, only to end up giving them a ship that's non-functional, which Rutherford and his rival Livick argue about and can't decide how best to quickly get the ship back in operation until, at Talyn's suggestion, they go to the Mark Twain holodeck simulation that Boimler and Rutherford always use to settle their disagreements by each pretending to be Mark Twain and hashing it out over a lemonade or mint julep or whatever which enables them to form a consensus as to how to proceed. After the encounter with the Ferengi, Mariner's ship is damaged but still maneuverable, so she decides to take the Genesis device to a nearby lifeless planet in order to detonate it to keep it out of Nick's hands. But before she can do that, Nick's fleet catches up with her, causing her, in an homage to the Wrath of Khan, to flee into a nearby ion storm, which Nick himself chases her into, though the other members of his fleet refuse to do so. At which point he tries to convince Mariner that they're the same, but she points out that while she sometimes disagrees with orders, she still believes in the mission. And when he tries to invoke her friend Cito's death and blame it on Starfleet, she reminds him that what really happened was that she died doing something she believed in by choice. And that, and she also points out that it was he who got the member of his squad killed performing the Starburst maneuver and that it happened because of his ego. Back on the Cerritos, we see the ship under the command of kick-ass acting Captain Boimler, 
who is dragging the Orion battleship by tractor beam to throw it at the shield, which breaks it, though I'm not sure how, which allows Captain Freeman and others from the bridge crew to get through the hole that it makes in the Cerritos' captain's yacht before it closes up again. This, of course, caused all the members of Nick's fleet to abandon him completely, at which point he beams over to the Starfleet ship to try to get the Genesis device back, only to find that Mariner has already activated it, which he tells him only to find that he thinks he can disarm it. And as they're arguing, Captain Freeman beams Mariner away, and then Mariner insists that they beam Nick out as well, but they're unable to because he reactivates the shields. And when he can't complete the disarm because the bomb asks for two strips of gold breast latinum, it blows up as the captain's yacht flees the Genesis wave on impulse power for some reason, which apparently created a new M-class planet that Starfleet has named Locarno, since his atoms were part of the Matrix. In the aftermath, upon being happily greeted by friends, Mariner explains that while she's been dealing with some heavy stuff the past few months and being kind of a nudge, she's gotten through it and has decided that she might even stop self-sabotaging herself for once going forward. And as they all celebrate how things turned out, as well as they did, and the fact that Talyn is determined not to go back to her Vulcan ship, Tendi's sister sends an Orion ship to collect Tendi, bringing about her departure from her friends and a particularly tearful goodbye with Rutherford, after which she sets her sights on doing what it is that she needs to do now that she's back with the Orions, while seemingly being keen to figure out a way to get back to the Cerritos. So I really, really liked this episode. I thought it was an excellent season finale. And just a, a great episode all around. It tied a lot of threads together that we've been, you know, dealing with the past season and throughout the seasons as it concerns Mariner for sure. And it just was really well done. They revisited some of the funniest stuff from the season when they went into the Mark Twain holodeck simulation. They made a quick joke about how Nick Licarno looks exactly like Tom Paris, but they didn't belabor it. So I thought that was cool. You know, they left some of it unexplained, like how did he get this very highly advanced ship that he used to capture all the other ships? How did he create that giant shield which apparently surrounded an entire solar system? But, you know, if you just figure, well, he just did. Because, you know, he's associating with all these other races. We don't know what technology all of them have. So obviously he managed it. And you just go with it. It was great to see Boimler in command of the ship. He did it really really well he was confident he knew what he was doing he did it right that was just a great hero moment for him i thought that was awesome and there were really fantastic visual and audio references to star trek to the wrath of khan the genesis wave that comes out when the device explodes is exactly like it was in the movie the scenes in the ion storm were like a shot for shot recreation of the Mutara Nebula sequence from that same movie or, or, you know, of parts of it. So it just was really, really great. The comedy was there too, but it was snappy and again, not overly zany. It was at a good level and, you know, it was just great to see Mariner sort of come around to the fact that, you know, things are going to be different now because she's gotten past all the stuff that she's gotten past. They did kind of make Nick Lacarno into a bit of a mustache twirling villain, which doesn't really comport with his character from the first duty. But, you know, it's a cartoon and it's supposed to be a parody of Star Trek in a way. So I thought, you know, it worked for this show and it was just great. It was a great episode and it served as a great finale for the season. It did leave us with a bit of a cliffhanger in so much as we don't know what's going to happen with Tendi. But hopefully they'll get a season five, which hasn't been announced yet. And hopefully, you know, that will be something that we see early on in season five. You know, how she deals with being back in Orion and how she's able to get back to the Cerritos, which if they do it right, should take a couple of episodes. But that's really it. I thought it was a really great episode and a really great finale. If you haven't seen it yet, go ahead and watch it. And uh, I think you'll agree. I'm going to get out of here, but I'll be back with another video soon. Until I return, I wish you peace and long life.